Latham, and I'm the uh, moderator for today's uh, terrific uh, first panel. And with me, and I'll just do brief introductions because their full our full bios are in the program materials. Uh, first, uh, Professor Joel Eisen. Good to see you, Joe, again. Uh, he's at the beautiful University of Richmond. Uh, then we have Professor Shalana Baker, who is with uh, Northeastern, and then Meg Sheehan, who is a public interest uh, uh, environmental lawyer and has done so for, for practice in this field for 30 years and is highly regarded and widely recognized for her work in the field. Uh, and then we'll be joined by Rebecca Hinosa, who's with uh, the Sierra Club uh, and is doing work down in the uh, Texas Gulf Coast uh, region where she is an artist and an organizer and has been fighting uh, LNG terminals and uh, the, 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 the border wall extension now for several years. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, and, and Joe, uh, why don't you kick things off for us? And again, you'll, you'll have 15 minutes. Uh, and if you have questions, please put those in the uh, chat and we'll get to them uh, at the end of the presentation. So thank you all again. Great. Well, thanks so much, Mark, for that introduction. Uh, it is great to be back at VLS, even if remotely from one year ago, I was giving a presentation as a distinguished scholar about clean energy justice, and that was a more wide-ranging agenda based on an article that Shelley Welton from the University of South Carolina and I had done about an emerging agenda for clean energy justice. I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate all of the other members of this panel for their hard work. I'm going to be referring to some of it as I go along here, particularly the, the work by Professor, Professor Baker. Today I have for you a case study, and that case study is in my home state of Virginia. And it is a case study of actions that were taken during the legislative session, but also implicated regulatory actions. And so, on the one hand, it shows a lot about how far we have yet to go in bringing attention to matters of energy justice in places like Virginia. But it also, there were some successes, and I'll point to those as I, as I went along. As you can see from the snapshot that I've got here on this first slide, the objective in the legislative session was to bring relief to people who are suffering due to the pandemic, particularly in black and brown communities, who were already facing high electric bills before the pandemic, with that situation being exacerbated during the pandemic. So next slide, please. The Virginia General Assembly meets from January to March, ordinarily but a special session was called in August of 2020 to deal with COVID-19 impacts. The budget bill is the legislative vehicle for dealing with this. It is in Virginia, an omnibus bill that deals with state spending that also supersedes other state law. And so I'm gonna be talking about legislative bills that were proposed during the session, but the ultimate outcome of the session was the budget bill. And the session was called as a wide ranging session to deal with such matters as criminal justice reform in the aftermath of the events this summer, the governor's power during emergencies, which Republicans wanted to talk about, but also policy choices for relief for those who were suffering due to the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Now, energy insecurity didn't start with the pandemic. Professor Sonia Carley and others have talked about this, how many Black, Latinx, and low-income families were already paying a high share of income to cover their energy costs. And as Professor Baker has pointed out, these are also communities that were most at risk for COVID-19. And so when the legislative session was called in Virginia, this was an issue that rose to the fore as part of the agenda to do something about people who were suffering because of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So many of you are probably aware 
that there were moratoria across the country on shutoffs for people who couldn't pay their utility bills during the pandemic. And you're probably also aware that many of these moratoria are about to expire. The one in Virginia was extended through October 5th, with the hope being that these issues were going to be addressed during the special legislative session. Next slide, please. The commission, the State Corporation Commission, our Public Utility Commission, refused to extend the moratorium beyond that date, saying that there would be impacts on other ratepayers if the moratorium was extended. And so if any action was going to be taken, it was going to be taken in the legislative session. Next slide, please. Now, one thing that was particularly interesting about this session was that two different efforts combined to bring these issues to the fore. The first one had been going on for some time, and in fact, I was involved in it, testifying before the assembly in the regular session. And that is refunds to ratepayers of money that the state's largest utilities were making that was in excess of what they're allowed to make. There's a long story there. I'm going to tell a little bit of it as we go forward, but there were constituencies that were involved in trying to force the state's utilities to refund money back to ratepayers. And then second, there was freestanding legislation that was moving to extend the moratorium and try to provide relief for those who were most adversely affected by the pandemic on their utility bills. Uh, next slide, please. So the primary way that this happened was two different legislative efforts. The first one was uh, a bill in the House to use overcharges to fund electricity bill relief. The second was a more narrowly tailored effort in the Senate to provide an emergency debt repayment plan to give people uh, 12 months or 24 months to stretch out their repayments of the, uh, uh, of the arrearages on their utility bills. Next slide, please. A little bit about how the overcharges happened. You, Virginia utility law is significantly different from that in many other states. When re-regulation happened in 2007, after the state tried retail competition, it didn't work, the General Assembly ended it with a law that was largely written by the state's utilities. This law takes a lot of the discretion out of the hands of the Public Utility Commission and puts it in complex legislative provisions that all work in favor of the state's utilities. This code section is complex and has been made even more so. But the important thing for our purposes is, is that it completely departs from traditional regulation of utilities and is much more prescriptive about what happens. And again, it all works in favor of the utilities. Next slide, please. So it works in three basic different ways. The first one is a legislative provision that gives the utilities an extra rate of return. The third one is a refund ceiling that allows the utility to keep overcharges. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I'll, I'll skip over this, but effectively the state's utilities get to make extra profits because that is explicitly described in the state's utility statute. Next slide, please. Here's the one that came up in the session. The utilities can actually keep refunds even if they overcharge and even if they overcharge with this excessive rate of return. In most states, if there is to be a refund back to utility ratepayers, it is determined in a rate case proceeding. The commission has broad latitude to offer a refund. In Virginia law, the utility by law gets to keep a fair amount of the refunds. In the 2015 rate case, it was ordered to re Dominion was ordered to refund $20 million to ratepayers, but got to keep a billion dollars in future overcharges. And after 2018, the legislature added a provision where 
even those amounts that were supposed to go back to consumers could be plowed into new projects through something called a customer credit reinvestment offset. Next slide, please. The, so the first legislative effort in this special session led to, was called for an emergency investigation of Dominion's refunds. And this received national attention a week ago in ProPublica and an article in the Richmond Times-Dispatch about the lobbying by Dominion that led to this state of affairs where Dominion has over-earned $500 million since 2017. The snapshot in the lower right is me saying, quoted in this article, is saying that there is no comparable refund provision like this anywhere in the nation. Next slide, please. So in the regular session, there had been a legislative effort to force Dominion to refund some of its money. Bill, that had been defeated after some very intense lobbying by the utility. And so the same patrons who had offered this bill offered it again in the special session, trying to do something about the refund provisions. Uh, next slide, please. And what this bill would have done was return some refunds to Dominion customers, but also create a debt forgiveness fund to give money to help Virginians who had accrued debt to Dominion during the pandemic. And the regulatory commission would administer this fund using overcharges to help those who had been suffering on their utility bills. Next, next slide, please. A coalition of advocacy organizations called for passing of this bill and noticed that in this session, after the pandemic had hit, this coalition said that holding Dominion accountable for its overcharges would be explicitly tied to help lower income families and families of color during the pandemic, and that allowing Dominion to con continue overcharging and to not refund the overcharges would exacerbate the problems caused by the pandemic. Next slide, please. At the same time, legislation was pending in the Senate to offer residential customers an emergency debt repayment plan. There was no funding for this and no moratorium extension. It came under heavy criticism as a, a fig leaf to cover up the real problem. Next, next slide, please. So neither of these bills went anywhere. The refund bill was referred to the House that took action. The Senate committee passed the emergency debt repayment plan and hoped that it could be synced up with the budget, but that's a polite way of saying it's, it's dead. Uh, next slide, please. So governor proposed putting these two together, using overcharges for COVID relief. And he wanted this to be a feature of the budget bill. Next slide, please. The result was some mixed success. The House budget bill did not include the governor's proposal to use refunds money to forgive some unpaid utility bills. But it did include some relief for customers who are behind on their payments. So next slide, please. The moratorium under the, the House version of the budget, which is the one that is most likely to become law, the session is, is still ongoing. The moratorium is continued until the governor determines that the pandemic conditions have improved so that the prohibition doesn't need to be there. The only language from the two bills that was included was to offer a repayment plan. The House bill provided that there would be some funding to offset consumer debt, but it was funding coming from the federal government by virtue of the, of the CARES Act. And so the, the, the broader provision calling for using Dominion's hundreds of millions of dollars in refunds to provide relief for those most affected by the pandemic it is, not going, is not going to become law. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what does this tell us in the end? The first lesson from this is that energy justice issues were brought to the fore in a general in the General Assembly in the way that they had not been before. Before in the in the in the regular session in January through March, the discussion had all been about how the utility was making too much money. And very little of that discussion had been about who was most affected by the overcharges. Once the pandemic hit and we could see that the pandemic had had impacts on lower income communities and people of color, the, the discussion shifted. And the discussion shifted to this hybrid of returning refund money, but at the same time, using that money to alleviate some of the utility related problems that were caused by the pandemic. So even though that didn't happen, these issues were brought to the fore in a way they hadn't been before. And we notice if we look at the dynamics that were at play during this situation, that there was a connection made between those who were advocating for fairness to ratepayers and those who were advocating for justice concerns. And this was a more explicit, more targeted, and more powerful message than it had been in the past. The problem, of course, is that is the one that is illustrated in the ProPublica story. The political muscle of the state's utilities is substantial. They in the regular session, Dominion alone had 34 registered lobbyists at the General Assembly session and had considerable political power to prevent virtually anything that the utility didn't like from becoming law. Even with the governor's backing for the idea of refunding overcharges for COVID relief, and even with some bipartisan support, once Dominion threw its political muscle behind the effort to, to keep this from happening, it was not going to happen. And another problem was that was money. In, in Virginia, if a legislative effort is going to require new expenditures, it has to go through the Appropriations Committee, which is well known as a graveyard for killing legislation. So what I would say here is that a coalition had a coalition formed here to advocate for reforms in a way that no one ever really had in in Virginia. But the result is something of a mixed success. And of course, there isn't any real targeted relief to those who are suffering the most because of the pandemic. I, I look forward to hearing from what what Professor Baker and others have to say about this in 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 other in other sessions. But I just wanted I wanted to point out that even though this looks like an absolute complete disaster for justice advocates, that the coalition is, is there and there are roots that have that have formed here. I think that are going to be very useful uh, up the line. And. Thanks so much. I look forward to hearing about the conversation. If anybody has more questions, I know I skipped over the Virginia specific stuff a little bit, a little more to the main, at the main message. But if anybody has more questions, I'll, I'll be glad, glad to handle them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Shalanda. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be a part of this discussion. And I, I just want to thank the hosts at Vermont Law School. Um, and Joel, we have to talk <laughs> after this, but um, I'm so fascinated and grateful, I'm fascinated by and grateful for your presentation. Um, so I want to talk broadly without giving you all whiplash. I am going to take you on a little bit of a a world tour um, that starts in Mexico. So next slide. So my entry point into energy justice began about a decade ago when I landed in a place called Oaxaca, Mexico, which is the windiest place in the world and the epicenter for Mexico's energy transition. I landed there and met um, indigenous people who were fighting against large scale wind development in this place. Um, in the ensuing decade, um, that 
place, which is again, the epicenter of Mexico's transition, has seen over 2,200 megawatts of large scale wind energy development. And that's problematic for a lot of reasons, but even 10 years ago, the, the folks there who were among the poorest um, in the country um, recognized that this clean energy transition um, was going to leave them behind. And in fact, would lead to some of the same um, results that we have seen with fossil fuel development. And as a scholar, I began to interrogate um, our mechanisms for development. And what I found is that so long as we are relying on the same logics and mechanisms of development, we are bound to replicate inequality in our clean energy transition. And again, a decade ago, I didn't realize that I was beginning to write about energy justice, but that is exactly um, what road I embarked upon. Um, next slide. So fast forward just about seven years from that first moment encountering indigenous people who were displaced and dispossessed by large scale wind development. I found myself again back in Mexico um, at a meeting hosted by the state's, inner, the, um, sorry, the, the country's Department of Energy to talk about how to share benefits of the energy transition, but they had excluded um, the beneficiaries themselves who were indigenous peoples. And the folks from Oaxaca actually came into that room, crowded around and held court saying that we were not invited to this meeting, um, but we came anyway. And this was a fascinating um, moment where energy justice, as Joel was sort of alluding to, kind of came to the fore um, because one of the core aspects of energy justice is procedural justice. And the folks here were excluded. So again, um, this is this is sort of my formative stage. And I'm, again, laying this foundation um, because the story continues. Um, next slide. It turns out that the issue of replicating inequality within our energy transition is not simply one that is um, isolated to the global south or places like Mexico, but is very much something that is replicating itself um, here in the United States. So in 2014, I joined the faculty at the University of Hawaii School of Law. And shortly thereafter, um, the state adopted the first in the nation 100% renewable portfolio standard where the state had declared that it wanted to, to meet 100% of its um, energy needs through renewable energy by the year 2045. And this was revolutionary at that time. However, as I began to ask questions around um, the state about how this, um, how folks were in, engaging um, Black Indigenous people of color in this transition, as well as how they were thinking about including um, the same communities within the development itself, I was met with blank stares. Many people saw the energy transition in Hawaii as one that purely involved switching the fuels from fossil fuels to clean energy, um, and rather than using the energy transition as a mechanism to think about uh, inequality that was already baked into the energy system. And again, this is one of the key inquiries um, of energy justice. How can we use this moment of transition to transform our society and remedy the harms of the past? Next slide. So this has been the focus of my work. Um, again, I took you on a little bit of a quick tour of kind of how I <laughs> got to this place. Um, but this has been my focus for the last decade. I now run um, something called the Initiative for Energy Justice, which is a national organization that provides technical assistance and support to frontline Black, Indigenous people of color um, and those communities that are um, going to be first and worst impacted by climate change. We also provide support to policymakers who are interested in how to embed issues and principles of equity in their policymaking, much like um, the policymaking process that Joel was sort of walking us through in his presentation. We are three lawyers primarily who founded the organization, and now we have a team uh, of students from across disciplines, including law students who are working with us. Um, and we also have folks from all over the country who are part of our team. Um, next slide. So in many ways, I feel like my experiences from Mexico to Hawaii and now with the Initiative for Energy Justice have prepared me for this particular moment. 
And what is this moment? Um, I like to call this moment a reckoning. It is a moment of profound reckoning um, with the racial injustice and structural inequality that we have come to accept as a natural and inevitable part of our society. And I would say that the energy system is not immune from this reckoning. And in fact, it is particularly implicated in this moment of reckoning, um, not only with respect to the racial justice issues that we see on the streets, but also with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I wanna run through a few um, points here um, in this presentation. So next slide. So with respect to the energy system itself and the structural inequality that is embedded within it, we have to take a moment to deal with the legacy of harm um, that many environmental justice scholars have been working on for decades. Um, we also have to interrogate how we are marching down the path to 100% clean energy. And I know that folks on the next panel are gonna be talking about that. Um, and as Joel alluded to, we also have to interrogate the investor-owned utility model as the key sort of entity that is relied upon um, to engage in this transition, among other things. We also have to reckon with energy burden and energy insecurity, with disp which disproportionately impact folks of color in this country. Um, and then we also have to think about clean energy access and how clean energy can either replicate inequality or be used as a mechanism for deeper structural transformation. So I wanna to turn to um, COVID-19 and run through a few slides quickly, just again, to ground us in this moment. Um, next slide. So early on in the pandemic, um, way back in April, which is a million years ago, we realized that COVID-19 would have disproportionate impacts on black people. And later we found out also, um, you know, people of color in general. So um, there is a disproportionate impact um, with respect to death rates um, when compared to the actual in um, actual population within a place. So we can take these examples from Louisiana, Illinois, Michigan, North Carolina, and Chicago, where the number of deaths um, in the Black community far exceed the, the share of the population. Next slide. Um, the New York Times also did a study around the 4th of July, which again was like a thousand years ago, um, <laughs> that showed that uh, black and brown folks were more likely to be infected as well as more likely um, to die from the virus. And we're talking about two to three times higher rates of, of death and infection. Um, and the interesting thing about their study is that they only were able to get access to this data by suing the CDC, which is fascinating. Um, so I want to turn a little bit. So there are a lot of reasons um, for the disproportionate exposure rates. A lot of that has to do with the structure of our economy. Um, the death rates are interesting. And I think we're going to see a lot of research out over the next um, years in the coming decade about why people of color are dying. Um, but the next slide, um, there was an early study um, done by the Harvard Chan School of Public Health that was not yet peer reviewed, but that revealed that just a small exposure um, to air pollution led to an increase in the COVID-19 death rate. And so we know from our um, long legacy of studying environmental justice in this country that black and brown communities were precisely those communities that had exposure, um, disproportionate exposure to air pollution. Next slide. And that exposure is extraordinary. I mean, here is a slide that shows that um, Black and brown folks, Latinx and Black people are um, exposed to a significant amount more pollution than they produce as compared to white Americans. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, I run an initiative um, for energy justice and our team was very interested in how these national patterns were playing out right in our backyard here in Boston. And I know that there are probably a ton of people here not from New England, not from Boston. So um, what I've done here is I have circled the communities that um, early on were seen as having high uh, COVID-19 cases. And so the communities that I've circled are Mattapan, Rosendale, um, Dorchester, Roxbury, and that's the dark um, red part that's circled there. And then in the 
upper right hand corner, the northeast of our city, Chelsea, Revere, Everett. These are um, majority Latinx communities, immigrant communities. And Chelsea, um, Mass, actually at one point in the pandemic had the highest rates of infections in the country. And so in our city, we see a similar pattern where black and brown communities have higher infection rates. Next slide. And these are the same communities that are disproportionately exposed to air pollution. And that's for a lot of reasons. These are environmental justice communities. Um, there are transportation patterns that lead to some of this air pollution, as well as um, dirty generation and, and um, uh, facilities that are polluting these communities. And so next slide. So when you can when you put these two things side by side, we see again a very similar pattern where black and brown communities are exposed as well as uh, exposed to COVID nineteen as well as um, in high air um, pollution areas. Next slide. So again, linking back to this reckoning with racial justice that we are facing in this country. Um, these are the same communities that are calling out for criminal justice, criminal reform. Um, and in the same breath or in the same vein, um, they can't breathe, right? They can't breathe because of the pollution that is littering their communities and making it difficult for them to survive on a daily basis um, and thrive. Um, and this is an image here from Port Arthur, Texas, which is the epicenter and the birthplace of the modern fossil fuel industry. It also happens to be my father's birthplace and um, my, that side of my family. And I learned, I've learned i learned a lot about um, that side of the family through some recent projects that I've been doing. Um, but again, the, the idea of not being able to breathe and the idea of sheltering in place far predated or long predated the pandemic. Um, many people in this Port Arthur area were asked to shelter in place um, routinely before the pandemic to cover their windows with plastic and other coverings um, simply because of the uh, the toxins in the air that um, were inadvertently released by the many, many facilities that um, are part of the fossil fuel industry in that area. Next slide. So again, coming back to Texas, or I'm sorry, coming back to, um, to Boston for a minute. Um, we wanted to understand the relationship between um, environmental justice communities and access to solar because again if we think about how the energy system can be used as a mechanism for transforming communities solar is one thing that we constantly look to um, but unfortunately the same communities that are ej communities the same communities that are impacted by covid are also communities that lack access to um, to rooftop solar. And here is a blow up of the area that I circled on the left in yellow. Um, so in the prior slides, they were this was in yellow. Um, and again, it's Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan that have very little solar access. And then I've compared that with um, more predominantly white communities here in the Boston area, Newton, Wellesley, um, Brookline that have more solar. Um, in their uh, census block areas. And you'll notice that there's a bigger circle in the Mattapan area, and we wanted to understand why. Um, and that is just because there is a, a lot of solar on two blocks in Mattapan, and that kind of made this look a little bit wonky. But again, this is preliminary data that we were just sort of looking at to understand, again, whether or not so there is room for growth in the solar um, in, in, in solar access, and there absolutely is. Um, next slide. So unfortunately, um, when we did an cl even closer look at, uh, when we took an even closer look at the solar access in black and brown communities here, we realized um, that the type of solar that black and brown communities got was less likely to be owned by individuals. And um, again, it's preliminary data, but I'm working on another project where um, it's clear that even when you control for home ownership and income, black and brown communities are still less likely to have access to solar that they own. And that's a fascinating thing. And I see this as a missed opportunity for economic justice, because as we'll see in the next couple of slides, these are the same communities that experience extraordinary energy burden and energy security insecurity. So I want to run through those slides quickly because I know I'm getting close to my time. Um, let's get to the next slide. 
Next slide, please. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so energy burden, just by way of review, is um, the overall percentage of household income that you spend on, on your energy or to meet your energy needs. The lower your income, the more you end up spending, the more proportionally you end up spending on um, energy. Energy insecurity is simply re um, lacking reliable access to energy sources at an affordable price. Next slide. So, Energy burden is high around the country, but it's particularly high in the Northeast, the Southeast, and pockets of the Northwest. Um, next slide. Um, in this country, energy insecurity is a significant problem. This is a slide from uh, data pulled by the EIA in 2015, showing that over 30% of Americans um, report some type of household energy insecurity. Next slide. But that type of energy insecurity is disproportionately um, disproportionately experienced by Black and Brown folks. So we see 45% of Hispanic and Latinx folks experiencing some sort of energy insecurity, over half of Blacks, 61% um, of Native folks, and 50% of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. Next slide. So um, this harkens back to um, Joel's research and the work that he's doing. Um, my team also has been looking at utility shutoffs. And um, early on, there were widespread moratoria, not as wide as we'd like. Some states didn't issue any moratoria. Um, they were doing that through a variety of mechanisms, including um, orders issued by the PUC, exec order, et cetera. Um, next slide. Um, Right now, we know that millions and millions of people are in an imminent danger of having their um, utilities cut off. Um, and uh, again, we've been sort of tracking this um, nationally, and, and we think it's a sleeping giant that is actually going to come and bite us in a big way over the next several months. Next slide. So COVID-19 has actually called upon us to reckon with environmental burdens, reckon with the economic burdens, um, as well as the benefits that are coming out of this energy transition. And the, the real call um, is to use energy justice as a mechanism um, and as a theoretical framework to engage in policymaking and problem solving during this moment of deep reckoning. Next slide. And so we need to do a few things um, in this um, moment. And uh, oh, Professor Baker, I have to ask you to quickly wrap up. Yep, absolutely. And I was actually just going to start. I no, I deleted um, a few slides. Oh. So yeah, um, I, I'll just end oh, here go, go because. Ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I'll just end here. Energy justice is absolutely a framework that we should be using, and I look forward to answering your questions uh, um, on that. So thank you for the slide um, presentation, Emily. I appreciate your help, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Shalanda. Uh, uh, Meg, now after Meg, if, if Rebecca hasn't joined us, we're going to go to Q&A. Uh, and, and I know Joel and Shalanda had a few more things to say, so uh, hopefully... Uh, if she doesn't show up, you, you'll have an opportunity to do that. So, so, so May, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, and everyone for having me. I will share my screen. Um, I think I can do that to show my PowerPoint. Are you seeing my screen? Do you see my screen? Uh, I do not. Uh, okay, I'm going to share. Okay, here we go. How about now? Uh, yeah, it looks like you see it now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ah, there you go. Um, thank you. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Meg Sheehan. I'll be talking about the externalities associated with one form of so-called clean and green renewable energy, and that is um, hydropower. And specifically, I will be um, setting my clock here, um, talking about Canadian hydropower. So I'll take you on a whirlwind tour as well. And so we will start in Canada. Just to give you a brief overview, there are hundreds of large dams across Canada that have been built over the last hundred years, and much of it is supplying exports to the United States. 
So Canada's economy, as you may know, is built on resource extraction, hydropower development, tar sands, fossil fuels, mining, et cetera. These dams are on a massive scale. And in particular, I will want to focus on new dams that are under construction today, as well as those existing dams and their transmission corridors. So this is a bit of an advocacy piece. You can see the types of work that we're doing. Um, and to put this all in perspective, it's really important to understand the massive scale of these projects. This is in British Columbia, the Peace River. The third dam is being built there now, Site C Dam, and this is what the river looks like now. These are not simple run of the river, little dams like we might see in New England. They're a massive scale. Another picture of the Site C River. Um, this was what the Muskrat Falls um, site in Labrador, Canada looked like prior to the construction of the almost now $12 billion Muskrat Falls um, called the Lower Churchill Project. Hydro-Quebec has this four dam complex under construction now, $6.8 billion. Uh, this gives you an idea of the scale, the type of blasting and blowing up of granite mountainsides that is done for the so-called clean energy. This will tell you a little bit about the scale of the transmission corridors that are being proposed um, to import this to metropolitan areas like Boston and New York. Up on the right-hand side, we see Churchill Falls Dam. That's the Muskrat Falls area that I spoke about earlier and that I'll be referring to at the end. So we're talking about currently exporting about 17% of New England's hydroelectricity from these remote areas of subarctic Canada and proposals to import more via four new hydropower corridors. And this is not locally generated and the impacts are felt in these very remote areas by the communities living there. The impacts of dams, large dams are well documented. Downstream we have reduced biodiversity, poor water quality, et cetera. We have the dam itself that blocks fish migration, disrupts the flow of sediments, and of course there's um, hazards from aging dams, many of which uh, in Canada are now aging. But I would also like to focus on the reservoir, which does contribute to global warming. This is not carbon-free power as the industry would have us believe. These reservoirs emit massive amounts of methane and carbon dioxide. The reservoirs also serve a big role in displacing communities. For example, in Canada, Hydro-Quebec's largest dam is the Le Grand Complex. It has flooded and diked and diverted 32,000 square miles to collect water in a reservoir that is 1,200 square miles. So we're talking about the loss of carbon sequestering forests, peatlands, and taiga, and the diversion and disruption of river systems. And not only do these reservoirs have environmental impacts, they also have serious human and social impacts on the local communities. Worldwide, about 80 million people are estimated to have been displaced by uh, large dams. And this isn't just happening in Canada, it's an issue all over the world. And of course, the people most impacted are voiceless and marginalized communities who don't have a say in the process. As far as Canadian dams, I'd like to focus on methylmercury contamination caused by Canadian hydropower for a minute, because it is an impact on marginalized and frontline communities that's often not um, acknowledged in the permitting process either in Canada or in the US. So how does methylmercury contamination occur? Mercury is a naturally occurring material sequestered in organic materials, soils and forests, etc. The flooding of these reservoirs and the ongoing operation of the dams themselves cause erosion and the organic material decomposes, releasing the mercury into the waterways. It then transforms by a biological process into methylmercury, 
which then enters the food chain from the lowest forms of plankton and upwards, as you can see by this chart, into the food supplies that are relied on by indigenous and local communities in these remote areas of Canada who rely on these wild foods for their survival. This is not theoretical. It's been happening for many years since Hydro-Quebec and other uh, hydro development started occurring in Canada. In 2016, the Harvard School of Public Health did a study of the impacts on Indigenous communities' food supplies from the proposed development of 22 large hydro power dams. They looked at all 22 of them and found that they almost all exposed indigenous communities to unacceptable levels of methylmercury contamination in their food supply. They predict, these are the more specific results from the study, um, which were um, well documented, but ignored in the regulatory process. So how is this happening? In Canada, resource extraction is under the jurisdiction of individual provinces, which are like our states. So these are crown corporations that have as their sole shareholder, the government. So Hydro-Quebec, for example, is the agent of the Quebec government and has the sole jurisdiction over the resource extraction of hydropower development. In turn, the Quebec government, um, its owner, makes and enforces the rules. So you can see right there that that is a setup for a lack of transparency, uh, well documented going on until this moment. Uh, we have examples in Labrador where the Commission of Inquiry was formed. The province itself spent $16 uh, million, $16 million um, conducting an inquiry into the cost overruns and, and mismanagement of the Muskrat Falls uh, Dam that just went online in 2019, found violations of Indigenous rights and uh, mismanagement, et cetera, but it had no power to enforce anything. So there really is a lack of transparency and accountability, example after example, across the country. So the communities that are most impacted by hydro development in Canada are those who are marginalized, who have no voice. These are the indigenous communities that lived on the land in the subarctic areas for millennia. Uh, it's totally self-sufficient, hunting, gathering, um, fishing, and trapping. As I mentioned earlier, these communities still are forced to rely on these traditional methods of survival because of their remote location. They were forced off their lands as a result of Canada's colonialism. They were forced onto reserves to make way for hydro development and other resource extraction. Today, some of these, or these First Nations are speaking out again and the Aboriginal communities um, who are not actually First Nations, but sovereign um, governments such as New Nazi government in Labrador, which has been very concerned about methylmercury poisoning of wild foods from the Muskrat Falls dams. So most recently in October of 2020, we had five First Nations from Quebec who live on the North shore of the St. Lawrence River uh, on reserves, many of them where they have no clean water, no electricity. They speak uh, largely their indigenous languages and perhaps French as a second language. They are have been surrounded by hydropower development that has torn at the social fabric of their communities, preventing them from conducting their um, original their Aboriginal lifestyles of hunting, fishing, and gathering, disrupting the social fabric and forcing them into impoverishment. So the again, the irony, they are surrounded by Hydro-Quebec's dams and reservoirs, but many of the communities have no electricity and no running water. They came out in opposition to the export of more Canadian hydropower versus via the um, 
New England Clean Energy Connect, violently mislabeled in my view, that would Oh, did we just lose May? Let's give a minute here if we can get her back. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, huh. Oh, and Re Re Rebecca has uh, joined us. So she'll and, be next. Uh, but, uh, human rights, oh, UNDRIP, is. various treaties that they entered into, as well as the Canadian Constitution. Also in October, the Inu Nation of Labrador um, announced it was suing over the disruption to its land and culture by Hydro-Quebec's Churchill Falls project, which I referred to earlier as one of the very large um, projects that one of the largest reservoirs in the world, 2,600 square miles that flooded the Inno's traditional land. This is a picture of the um, Upper Churchill that the Innu are concerned about. You can see before and after what that dam has done to this traditional sacred uh, Mistashipu River. So this slide is intended to highlight that the hydro industry op operates without accountability. And this was really demonstrated in 2019 when the Provincial Crown Corporation that developed the dam, NALCOR, flooded the reservoir in complete disregard of the Harvard study that recommended clearing the reservoir to mitigate the methyl mercury, and in disregard of a special federal joint panel that had also recommended uh, removing the materials in the reservoir in order to mitigate methyl mercury. Uh, the Nunasiv government was uh, very concerned about this and spoke out about it, but the government went ahead and flooded the reservoir anyway. So most dams used today for export were built without any environmental impact studies or consultation, and the consultation and impact studies that are being done today are completely inadequate. Hence, we have frontline communities speaking up about this. and. Um, it's very concerning to uh, many folks because the science is coming out to show that even though hydropower has traditionally been considered clean and renewable, it actually is emitting, especially these Canadian dams that flood vast areas, emitting methane and carbon dioxide that can be on par with fossil fuels. So we're really switching one dirty energy for another. The hydro industry in Canada is able to get away with this greenwashing. There's never been a complete carbon accounting of Hydro-Quebec's site-by-site um, -site reservoirs. No one really knows what the carbon emissions are from these dams. So not only are we causing cultural genocide of local communities, but we're also making the climate worse and remote Arctic communities are uh, well documented to be some of the communities on the front lines of climate change. They rely on sea ice to hunt and fish. The sea ice obviously is not melting. The Arctic Ocean is experiencing some of the fastest warming on the planet. So this is almost a double whammy. Uh, oh, Meg, I'm sorry and to interrupt, but you can got a, hear about a some of the left. resistance voices. Ready to wrap up. This is my last slide. Um, indigenous sovereignty Perfect. and climate justice obviously has to be part of our um, clean energy campaign. Thank you, Meg. Perfect time. Uh, 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 Becca, good morning and welcome to the VGL Symposium. Uh, you, you will be our, our last presenter for, on the um, clean energy panel on justice, uh, and we'll run to about uh, whoops until uh, ten fifteen or so, and then um, we'll take some a couple of questions. Uh, go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, good morning, y'all. Can you hear me? Hello. 
Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, uh, can you see my presentation? Uh, yes. Um, okay, great. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Becca Hinojosa. I'm the Gulf Coast uh, campaigner for the Sierra Club. And today I will be speaking about um, my community, where I'm from, the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, and um, you know the fight, the local fight that's happening here to stop three uh, fracked gas export terminals from being built. Um, so here's a photo at the top of what the region looks like now. The Rio Grande Valley region, um, you know, is pristine wetlands. Um, you know, we're a community on the Gulf Coast of Texas and also on the front lines of the U.S.-Mexico border, so on that very tiny tip. And here we have thorn scrub, we have cactus, um, you know, our the area around our port is largely unindustrialized. Uh, it's in the middle of an international wildlife corridor from Mexico into Texas. So that's what the region looks like now at the top. And at the bottom is what the Rio Grande Valley would look like if three fracked gas export terminals um, you know, went forward. And these fracked gas export terminals um, that are proposed are three different LNG companies, Rio Grande LNG, Anova LNG, and Texas LNG. Uh, LNG stands for liquefied natural gas. Um, and the reason why it's fracked gas that is liquefied uh, is because these companies, uh, in order to export fracked gas overseas, uh, it's it's ideal for them to super cool it uh, to negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, add chemical additives, and turn that fracked gas into a liquid, which allows them to store larger quantities of gas into these massive tanker ships and export it overseas. So, you know, what we could be looking at is this beautiful um, untouched area uh, that's very important for the local economy of the region, turning into a 3,000 acre uh, massive industrialized um, uh, area of fracked gas exports. And here's the region uh, that I'm from, the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. On the map, you can see the very bottom, there's four little green counties, Willacy, Cameron, Hidalgo, and Star. Those four counties make up the region of the Rio Grande Valley. And specifically, the three fracked gas export terminals are proposed in Cameron, right there at the very tiny tip, um, at the port. And we are also the communities with the highest poverty rates. This is the poorest region, um, most marginalized region uh, of Texas. And we have a pretty large population, um, 1.2 million people across those four counties. Um, and about 90% of the population is Latinx uh, or indigenous. And I mentioned, you know, these are three fracked gas export terminals. They want to export fracked gas. Um, the gas uh, would come from the Eagle Forge Shale Basin and the West Texas's Permian Basin. Uh, so there's a map there of Texas. You can see Permian Shell Basin is highlighted, the Eagle Forge Shale Basin. And this is via fracking. So fracking is a highly controversial uh, process of extraction that is you know, proven to be <clears throat> dangerous for air quality, uh, exacerbates and causes earthquakes, um, has been shown to pollute groundwater, and is absolutely you know the opposite of helpful for the climate change um, crisis. And it should be noted that West Texas's Permian Shell Basin is on par with. Um, you know, if it completely exploited, is on would be on par with Saudi Arabia, uh, and would release uh, a massive amount of uh, carbon emissions. We refer to this uh, as a carbon bomb. 
And here are the, just a quick look at the three projects and who's behind them. Uh, one of these proposed projects is called Texas LNG. Another of the proposed fracked gas export terminals we're fighting is Anova LNG, Rio Grande LNG, and then the associated pipelines that would bring in the fracked gas from the Eagle Forge Shale Basin and the Permian uh, Basin. And those pipelines are the Rio Bravo Pipeline and the Valley Crossing Pipeline. So you can see they're owned by many different companies. Um, some of these companies are new and don't have existing projects. Um, these are well known and have had uh, massive energy projects uh, all over the US and those are Enbridge and Exelon. Uh, next slide. And here's a map. Uh, so I mentioned that these three uh, fracked gas export terminals are proposed at our port in Cameron County. Uh, you can see uh, high, highlighted in yellow and black, there's Texas LNG, Rio Grande LNG, Anova LNG. And that long strip of blue is the, the, the channel that, would co that comes into the port. And then those green areas are wildlife refuges. Um, so this is what, where these three LNG terminals are proposed is in the middle of a international wildlife corridor with 20,000 acres of wetlands. Um, and, and the communities that would be immediately impacted are communities like Port Isabel, uh, Long Island Village, South Padre Island. There's several uh, small island communities within the Rio Grande Valley that are directly on the front lines. Uh, that would be right next to these three fracked gas export terminals. And I'll talk a little bit more about the impacts um, these smaller towns are facing. Um, so just a quick overview, um, and I'll go through a slide for each of these. The impacts that we would see if these fracked gas export terminals are built are, you know, a dramatic increase in air pollution. Um, this would exacerbate and worsen climate change. Uh, this would impact an international wildlife corridor. Uh, so this is ha habitat. This would be habitat fragmentation. Um, would impact endangered and threatened species that live in uh, this habitat. And indigenous rights violations, um, the original people of our region uh, are completely against the fracked gas export terminals and would be, uh, this would be detrimental for their community and their ancestors. And of course, uh, ecotourism. We are a coastal community um, and a large part of the economy relies on having a clean uh, environment for businesses such as fishing and shrimping. And I'll talk uh, more about that in each slide. So air pollution, here's just a quick preview of the uh, air emissions. Um, if all three fracked gas export terminals uh, are built. Um, so that column highlighted in gray is the estimate of air pollution from the three fracked gas export terminals. And the tons per year in the white column is the current amount of air pollution uh, in the region. And you can see that this would be a huge spike uh, in toxic air emissions compared to what we have. Um, and so, you know, these fracked gas export terminals would be the biggest polluters of toxic air emission in the entire Rio Grande Valley region. Um, and this is, I mentioned, we are a marginalized community. We are uh, people of color, um, Latinx, indigenous, uh, black and brown communities. Um, we have, you know, not enough hospitals. Uh, people don't have adequate access to health care. Um, and so this would be just de detrimental to the public health of the region. And just frankly, another example of, um, you know, environmental injustice, uh, environmental uh, racism. Oh, Rebecca, you have uh, five minutes. Okay, great. And uh, climate impacts, if all three fracked gas export terminals are built, that is 9.2 million tons per year of greenhouse gas emissions that would be released into the atmosphere. Absolutely terrible for... Oh no, we seem to have lost her. Yeah, Let's wait a, yeah, a few minutes or so, see if we get her back.
huge. Um, and, you know, we must Which absolutely is. stop this from going forward if we want to, um, you know, address the issues of climate change. And there are many, uh, you know, fracked gas corporations who try to say that they're a bridge to coal, uh, when in reality, they're just as terrible for climate change uh, as coal, if not in some cases worse. Habitat fragmentation. I mentioned that these three uh, fracked gas export terminals want to build corridor. Those green parcels are different wildlife refuges. And on the, the smaller zoomed in map, you can see those are the three proposed sites right in the middle of a wildlife refuge, right in the middle of that international wildlife corridor. Um, and species such as the endangered ocelot, the uh, endangered falcon, um, you know, they need access to uh, this wildlife corridor. Um, and that would allow for species, that's what allows for species um, uh, genetic uh, variation. Um, and other threatened species include the Texas tortoise, uh, migratory birds, sea turtles, and the largest wildlife refuge, there's several in that international wildlife corridor, is the Laguna Atascosa Wildlife Refuge. So here you have um, some local kids visiting uh, the wetlands uh, right where uh, these LNG, uh, these fracked gas export terminals plan to build. Uh, indigenous rights violation. The original people of our region are the Carrizo Comecrudo tribe of Texas. And one of these uh, fracked gas export terminals called Texas LNG plans to build on top of a federally recognized sacred indigenous site that has known ancestral burial grounds and the remains of a village. And here's a quote from the chairman of the Carrizo uh, tribe of Texas, Juan Mancias, he says, we ask that they stop ignoring the native original people of Texas, please, and to protect our sacred lifeways and sacred sites. So this is absolutely um, an injustice, um, a desecration of um, sacred lands uh, of the Carrizo Comacrudo tribe. Ecotourism. Uh, the Rio Grande Valley region has a huge benefits greatly from ecotourism. It has a huge economic impact, 463 million uh, uh, annually and supports more than 6,000 jobs. And that wildlife refuge, um, I mentioned Laguna Escosa, contributes significantly to the local area with 14.1 million per year in revenue. So these are jobs like shrimping, fishing, um, dolphin watch tours, boat tours, no, this is what sustains the local economy. And this is what's also completely threatened by fracked gas export terminals. They, these industries uh, thrive on a clean, pristine ecosystem. And in fact, where the fracked gas terminals plan to build is a very popular uh, shrimp nesting ground. And that's where the shrimp, shrimp grow and nest. And then the shrimpers go out in the bay and um, you catch those shrimp. And that's how people here locally feed their families. Becca, you got Community one minute opposition. Thank you. Um, there's tremendous opposition to the fracked gas export terminals. All of those smaller communities that would be directly impacted are completely opposed. They've passed resolutions against the project. They've convinced local school districts to uh, reject tax abatements. They've sent thousands of uh, anti-fracked gas comments to the regulators, and they've successfully convinced a French bank to divest from one of the projects and are actively pressuring other banks to commit to staying away. And this is, you know, one of many fights across uh, our country and, you know, across the planet that is opposed to fracked gas infrastructure. And we see that those, those fights are gaining momentum everywhere. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, uh, Rebecca, and th thanks to all of our speakers uh, this morning for kicking us off with, with a, a very uh, uh, interesting overview of the environmental justice uh, and other uh, uh, concerns re related to uh, both the current, our current energy system as well as the one that we hope to implement in the future. So we have um, about nine minutes for questions, and um, there have been several in the chat. Uh, but I, I want to start with one that um, uh, has to be a student who wrote, which I would love to uh, uh, 
throughout to everybody. So um, what steps can I take as a law student to bring clean energy justice into my career path? Uh, what, what are your, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Joel, Shalanda, <clears throat> Meg, and uh, Becca. Um, sure, I'll go first, but I think, I, Shalanda, why don't you go first? Because I, I, I'll, I'll say whatever you don't say. You've got a pretty broad ranging agenda. Go ahead, you go first. Sure. Well, first thing, contact me um, at the Initiative for Energy Justice. We're always in search of great <laughs> students to work with us. Um, and the second thing is um, energy justice is not something that is apart from the central questions of energy policy. So I think, you know, taking as many classes as you can that sort of get you oriented around the core fundamentals will be key, but taking a justice and equity lens into a mainstream regulatory position or um, a legislative role or even an AG's office. I mean, you know, there are, I think we're now at a really interesting tipping point where we have state AGs, we have regulators thinking about equity issues in the ways that Joel mentioned in his presentation. So I wouldn't see this as separate and apart from doing more mainstream energy um, work. I also would say um, that if you are more interested in doing work from the bottom up, there are now grassroots organizations that are engaged in this work all over the country and they need good lawyers. So, um, there are many, many opportunities, um, you know, post law school and also in the curriculum to just get your arms around the fundamentals and then use an equity lens to understand how those fundamentals have distributive consequences. Uh, thank you, Sean. Yeah, uh, uh, sure. Let me let me piggyback on that because that's a that's an absolutely terrific answer to this. If you think about I, I've put a link in the chat to our article about clean energy justice that identifies four different ways in which we need to make progress. And Shawana knows this article because she was part of an, an early group at South Carolina that was a workshop talk, talking about this piece. We One of these areas in which we have to play as energy lawyers is the existing legislative regulatory and, and obviously brought great attention to that. And what that means is in the, the hyper-technical areas where public utility commissions and legislatures get involved in things like utility rate cases and things like, if you think about my example, the way energy justice came up was understanding the very hyper-technical utility law about how utilities make refunds to their to their customers. And so I, I can't, what Shalanda said about understanding energy law, but also understanding that procedural process considerations at public utility commissions and before legislatures are extraordinarily important in uh, in being a student who is thinking in in going into these areas in virginia we don't have we literally have zero public interest organizations that are doing the kind of work that that meg and becca are talking about and so we have existing organizations that advocate for ratepayers we have existing organizations that advocate for lower income consumers but we literally have no one who is doing what what Shalanda is doing on a on a nationwide basis, and so the uh, just simply advocating for these issues in the existing policy environment is an enormously important piece of the landscape. And if you're listening to what Meg and Becca say, it's absolutely critical to understand energy law and work within the regular regulatory structure we have and then hopefully try to change it but anyway read uh, our article <laughs> thank you joe and, and shalana now meg and um becca one of the things that's really struck me about your presentations is the, the um impact of the dams on indigenous people and then the impact of these lng uh terminals if they get built on indigenous people could you each, each speak uh, or share with us a little bit more about the effects of the dam and then the LNG terminals on indigenous people? 
Sure, this is Meg. So as I mentioned, um, you know, people were forced off their land, their traditional lifestyles, hunting, gathering, fishing, using the river systems for highways, um, completely disrupted, forced to um, adopt and adapt to um, uh, colonial government, to, um, you know, white colonialism, and that whole, just completely tearing apart the fabric um, of their communities. And I'd like to point out in, and at least in this case, we're talking about transboundary uh, regulatory systems. So kind of related to that question about what could a student do, I totally agree understanding the arcane systems, for example, in the Northeast here and in the Midwest, we have the independent ser service operators who are semi-autonomous, they're not covered by FOIA, they run the grid, they make the rules, it's this almost Wizard of Oz type situation behind the scenes. We have a regulatory system on this side of the border with presidential permits and NEPA and everything that does not look at the other end of the extension cord, at least in terms of the dams and the impacts on indigenous people. There's never been a state, federal, local regulatory proceeding in the US that has taken into account the climate justice and social justice impacts on indigenous people. And that's what we're fighting for right now. I would urge students to ask the really hard questions, go behind the veneer of these greenhouse gas accounting systems and, and ask, well, are you really counting this? Where's the science? Um, how are you taking into account you know, climate justice and your laws and policies that supposedly um, promote climate justice. We're dealing with a situation where New York City is um, urging the import of Canadian hydro in order to prevent fossil fuel impacts on environmental justice communities in Astoria, Queens. So we're, they're pitting one environmental justice community against another. And so just really asking hard questions and not being afraid to put yourself out there. Thank you, Meg. Uh, 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 Becca, we don't have much time left, unfortunately, but uh, what, any, add one more thing that we should know about the LNGs and indigenous people in, in, in the area where you're doing your terrific work. Sure, <clears throat> sure, thank you all. Um, the original people of our region is the Carrizo Comacrudo tribe of Texas. And where the three LNG companies plan to build, um, that land has known ancestral burial, burial grounds um, that are federally recognized by the National Park Service um, that the National Park Service says are the premier um, historical sites of the county, if not the entire region. And, you know, these LNG companies have largely been you know, permitted uh, to build there. So this is once again, you know, absolutely colonization. It's destruct destruction of, um, you know, ancient burial grounds, ancient village sites. Um, and these LNG companies have never, never bothered to consult with the Garisoko Makudo tribe. Which um, is, so this is outrageous. Um, and, and unfortunately, outrageous. Uh, we have a 1020 hard stop. So I apologize. We have to stop there. And I want to thank Joel, Shalanda, Meg and Rebecca again for a terrific uh, present group of presentations. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, Vermont Journal of Environmental Law again for hosting this symposium. Uh, terrific job. And next will be the uh, keynote speaker at uh, 1030. So thank you all again. And thank those of us uh, who, who, are, who have joined us for these excellent presentations as well. And I hope you stay around all day because uh, it's a terrific uh, day of presentations on the very important uh, issue of uh, fossil fuels and the transitions that we need to make to a cleaner energy future. So thank you all. Be safe and healthy uh, and uh, take care. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.